Tonight's lecture is The Technology of Le Nozze di Figaro, or The Marriage of Figaro. And uh, because I'm going to go through these slides, what some of you might consider a little quickly, the slides are already available at uh, this website, bit.ly, as in Libya, slash Nozze Tech. No questions are off limits, although some answers might be. And because you may not be familiar with me, uh, I am an engineer and historian, and I've been working in opera media technology since 1972. In addition to my work at the Metropolitan Opera, I've worked for many other opera companies in the United States and some overseas. And um, my lectures, uh, as Lainey pointed out, on media technology and opera, and also on baseball and opera, are available on YouTube. And you can see some of my career at the Met here. On the left is a um, picture of me uh, when we were doing a low light level television experiment at the Met in 1973. And then on the right is uh, during our 14 hour live broadcast during the Met Centennial. And uh, then down at the bottom uh, during our 125th anniversary. So, what's the lecture about? Uh, I'm going to do a little bit on an introduction to opera and technology, and then some about technology in the opera house, and then media technology used to bring opera beyond the opera house, and then a little bit about technology that affects the plot of Le Nozze di Figaro. So here's an introduction to opera and technology. Um, it goes way, way, way back. Uh, we could start perhaps with Kepler's third law of planetary motion. Um, it was first published in um, 1619, and it was a long time after his first two laws of planetary motion, and that's because he was not only an astronomer, but also a lawyer, and he had to travel to defend his mother uh, against charges of witchcraft, and um, it was a long journey, and a friend recommended that he read the book on the right, and he did, and right after writing that book, he came up with the third law of planetary motion and credited that book with it. Well, the book that he read was... Uh, what some people consider the first book about opera, and it was actually written by Galileo's father, uh, Vincenzo Galilei. And then uh, you may be familiar with Antoine Lavoisier, the great uh, chemist, and he worked on opera house ventilation systems. Now, many technologies were actually created for opera, technologies we use today, uh, counterweights for scenery in theaters. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Lighting dimmers, electronic home entertainment, stereo sound transmission, pay cable, headphones, movies, live subtitles. They were all invented for opera. Down at the bottom there, you see a poster in Hungarian for a service in Budapest starting in 1893 that delivered the opera to homes by telephone wire. And because the opera didn't start until the evening, uh, during the day they invented newscasts, which they carried on the same telephone wires. And then incubated by opera, we have sportscasts and newscasts and uh, electronic hearing aids, radio, uh, diesel generators, um, color television, live cinema, and digital recording, all that opera played a significant role in the success of. Now here's a, somebody that those of you who are opera fans may be familiar with, John Shirley Quirk. He was an opera singer, one of the great interpreters of Benjamin Britten's operas. He was also a professor of chemistry and co-founder of Brunel University. Uh, here's Alexander Borodin, the composer of uh, the opera Prince Igor, the famous tune from that. He was also a research chemist and co-founder of St. Petersburg Women's Medical School. Here is um, Giulio Gatti Casazza, who's maybe the most famous head of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, he was spoofed by the Marx Brothers as Herr Gottlieb. He was spoofed by Disney in the movie Make Mine Music as Teti Tati. And he was a naval engineer. Well, all of those technological 
um, professions we're familiar with, chemist, naval engineer. But here's uh, somebody you may not be familiar with. His name was Giacomo Torelli, and he was an opera engineer. And he was an inventor of theatrical machinery for opera, including those theatrical counterweights that I mentioned before. And he was a reason that people went to the opera in 17th century Paris. If his name was listed as providing the machinery, then people go, oh, let's go see that Torelli opera, not the opera uh, by a particular composer or uh, put together by a certain director or conducted by a certain conductor or featuring certain singers. It was that Torelli did the machinery. So we'll talk a little bit more about that machinery in a moment. So let's talk about technology in the Opera House. Now here is an image of uh, the recent production of Figaro at the Metropolitan Opera and a nice intricate set and it's on a turntable and I'll show you that in a moment. Here is a diagram or an image of uh, what the backstage was like when the Metropolitan Opera, the new house of the Metropolitan Opera, opened in 1966. And it was and still is some of the most advanced theatrical technology uh, available. So the Figaro set is built on a giant turntable on one of the stages. Um, to minimize the scene changing time. They can just twist around and go from one scene to another. And notice near the top of the image there, there's a chandelier, and I've blown that up on the right so you can see two chandeliers. Uh, notice that they're up in the ceiling. We'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. So that was in the Metropolitan Opera House last year, and the house opened in 1966. What might Figaro have been like at the Wiener Burgtheater when uh, Le Nozze di Figaro opened way back in 1786? Well, uh, I haven't found much in the way of reviews of what the production was like, but I can tell you what technology was available. Opera was spectacular from the start. Now, when I say start, I don't mean the start of opera. We don't really know when the first opera was. Some people say it dates way back to the ancient Greeks. There are certainly things as early as the uh, late 12th century that some people consider to be opera. Uh, but we do know when the first opera house opened, and that was in 1637. So here's a design for an opera in the year 1637 and you can see a very complex set and there are flames coming out and there are uh, creatures flying through the sky. You know, could you have done that on a set in 1637? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is from a book that was first published in 1637. This is the second edition in 1638 which had some more technology in it and it was a handbook of how to stage various effects um, for operas and it tells you how to make waves appear, clouds, thunder, lightning, flames, how to fly creatures around, how to do a spotlight, how to do a lighting dimmer, how to do scene changes. I'm showing the lighting dimmer at the right and you see it lowers cans over candles and that makes things uh, darker. And then as far as scene changing, notice at the bottom of the picture on the left there's a capstan there for controlling this rolling cloud. I'll show you a live capstan in a moment. Here is a theater. It's uh, just outside of Stockholm. It's the Drottningholm Slottstheater or the Drottningholm Court Theater. And it opened in 1766. And it was a little opera house for the pleasure of Queen Ulrika. And the stage machinery was designed by Donato Stopani. And the machinery is really quite extraordinary, especially considering that this theater was intended to be put in on the cheap. When you enter it, you see things that look like wonderful gold, and they're actually um, yellow painted paper mache. So here are um, the wind machine on the left, the thunder machine on the top. It's sort of a coffin filled with rocks. Uh, that as you pull it, it goes crack on a wooden platform and then the rocks tumble and go blah, 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 blah. And then the machinery for controlling the curtain and you can see that the curtain could go um, open sideways, it could open vertically and also you can see the little ripples there, it can 
pull up as drapes, and that's the same thing that the Metropolitan Opera House curtain can do today. Here are uh, scenic wing flats, and um, this machinery is so extraordinary, it can do a complete scene change from, say, a park to a ballroom or vice versa um, in a matter of four seconds, not four minutes, but four seconds. And down at the uh, bottom near the center, you can see one of those capstans. You'll see that in operation in a moment. Then here are some scenic drops, and you can see um, you can raise and lower things. And again, there's a capstan down in the basement. I had uh, the privilege of um, going through this opera house um, from basement to above the stage, and you can still see the 18th century labels on the machinery. It's extraordinary. Um, the only thing they ever had to replace was the ropes. Um, here are some flying machinery. You could have Cupid flying around the stage and shooting arrows at someone. And then here are some trap doors and elevators. And the thing you see in the center at the bottom of the image is the elevator motor. Uh, that's for people to grab onto, and you'll see that in a moment again. And then here are some ocean waves. And uh, what's interesting about this, you might think, well, there's five wave rollers. Wouldn't it be nice to gear them together? Well, no. By having them individually cranked, you get different speeds for the different rollers, and the waves have a much more natural look to them. And when I show you the video, look in the back at the very beginning, and you'll see the rolling waves. And so uh, here's the lighting system. This is the only thing that's really changed um, from when the theater opened. They also put in a, a subtitle system. Um, but um, in terms of the type of scenic equipment that was available, it's a wooden opera house. This is the 21st century. It's in Europe. They're not going to allow candles to be used. So they put in a gigantic fiber optic system that delivers the light of a single candle to each location where a candle used to be. And then they use the 18th century lighting control mechanisms. You can see kind of a ship steering wheel at the center at the bottom. And that would rotate the uh, lighting uh, poles around the stage and would also raise and lower the footlights to control the lighting. And here it is in operation. And that, of course, is the music of the Marriage of Figaro. See the waves in the back. There's one of those rapid scene changes. Again, another rapid scene change. There's the motor, the capstan. Uh, there's actually a line of people who want to apply to do that. And here you see things rolling. One of the few changes they made was to um, change the casters. There's the elevator motor and the elevator going up. They changed the casters from wood to steel, but the steel made too much noise, and so they went back to the wood. There's a flying system, some god coming down. There's the wind machine, and in the background, the person on the ropes is doing the um, thunder machine, crack, crack, If you ever find yourself in Stockholm or uh, anywhere near there, I highly, highly, highly recommend a visit to this theater uh, to see what opera was like in the 18th century. And uh, I should point out why uh, the Drottningholm Slotstheater exists today. 
I mentioned that it was a plaything for Queen Ulrica, and then it was taken over by her son, who was the person who was assassinated in the opera Unbalo in Mascara because he was considered the opera king and he wasn't spending enough time on matters of state and spending too much time on opera. So um, the building fell into disuse and was just used as a storeroom. And then in the early 20th century, someone was looking for a painting and came to the palace and couldn't find it. And someone said, oh, why don't you try that building over there? And he went into the building and discovered this opera house and they hired a theatrical architect to find out how the machinery worked and once they figured it out it was this beautifully preserved opera house and so they put it back into operation. So here is a another shot from the Metropolitan Opera stage. This is from a production of uh, Le Damnation de Faust and you can see uh, there's a a uh, boat moving along and you can see the ripples in the water as the boat moves across the stage and uh, the reflection of the people in the boat. Um, that's all very nice except there isn't any water. So that um, reflection is projected, the ripples are projected, the motion is detected by infrared cameras fed into a server controlling the projector, and the projector then projects the reflected image. So projection, motion image projection, has a big role at the Metropolitan Opera these days. What about in 1786 when Figaro was performed? Could it have had a uh, role back then? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. Um, this is an image from a 1728 book about a production of Giulio Cesare at the Hamburg Opera in 1726. So um, that's 60 years before Figaro opened. And there's moving image projection. You can see an image of the skyline of London and then some fireworks and all of that was projected. At the bottom left is the sort of projector that might have been used. It's a magic lantern projector. And then the two things that you see to the right of it are some slides that could go into the magic lantern projector. And notice that the upper one seems to uh, be changing and it's got sort of a pipe coming out to the right. Well, that's the crank and you could control the motion by moving that crank and by using different materials, you could create fireworks or fountains as in the bottom slide and so on. So that's media technology in the Opera House. How about media technology to get the opera beyond the Opera House? Well, the idea was actually first proposed in the 17th century. In 1673, here was a proposal uh, that appeared in a book, Phonergia Nova, about using an acoustic duct to uh, pipe the sound of the opera outside the Opera House. And uh, today, that's what we would call a plaza cast. But here's a um, advertising poster for the production at the Met of La Nozza di Figaro last fall, October 18th. And this was for the high definition transmission live to movie theaters. Now, could that have happened in um, 1786? Well, the first transmission that the Metropolitan Opera did to movie theaters was actually in 1952, and that went to 31 cinemas in 27 U.S. cities. But the idea of transmitting opera to theaters actually dates back to 1877, at least in print it dates back to 1877. This is something that appeared in the New York Sun on March 30th of 1877, and it was a story about something that the writer was calling the electroscope. Uh, not the thing that measure, measures charge, but some form of television device. And it, it's a little hard to read, so I'll read it to you. Both telephone and electroscope applied on a large scale would render it possible to represent at one time on a hundred stages in various parts of the world the opera or play sung or acted in any given theater. So there's a prediction of what the Met is doing today with its HD Live and back in 1877. But, truth be told, in 1786, there was no live in HD cinema. There was no cinema whatsoever. Um, there was no television. There was no radio. There were no recordings. And here I'm showing a recording, an early recording, 
1929 of the uh, Nozze di Figaro Overture and uh, conducted by Yasha Hornstein. And he uh, conducted late into his life and once even had a heart attack while he was conducting. Um, but he had um, a, a tremor in his hands and so one time he was uh, going to conduct and he turned to the audience to take his bow and his hands were shaking a little bit and then he turned back to the orchestra and they saw what his hands were doing and he went um, so back in 1786 what was there if there were none of these media technologies well for one thing we had libretti and so here's a libretto from the 1786 Prague production of La Nozze di Figaro, uh, same year as it opened in Vienna. And this is a medium, it's a print medium, and people could take that home with them. So it was a way of disseminating the opera a little bit beyond the uh, opera house. But what about other technologies? Well, here is an opera playing robot from 1784. This is two years before the Nozze di Figaro opened in Vienna. So that was presented at Versailles, uh, was owned briefly by Marie Antoinette. The story is that she was freaked out by it, it supposedly looked too much like her, she thought it even had her own hair, and uh, so she gave it away to the French Academy of Sciences, which is why we have it today. If um, she had not given it away, it probably would have been destroyed. So that's good if you happen to be rich enough to be Marie Antoinette and you can have uh, these artists and 26 craftspeople build you a little opera playing robot. Um, but what about other stuff? Well, there was opera playback even earlier, and Mozart wrote for playback devices. So at the right is a clock that has an organ in it, and it played pieces from operas. And uh, just for your information, the picture at the center there is a barrel that's repinnable from 1480, so it's a programmable music playback device, and this is way, way, way before the Jacquard loom. This is more than 300 years before. Some people think the Jacquard loom was the first programmable device. But what if you were somewhat less heel well healed? Uh, you were just in the middle class. Well, at the left is a painting that's at the Frick Museum in New York and the woman has something in her lap and the painting is called Die Vogelorgel which is uh, the German term for what the French called a serenette and at the right is a close-up view of a serenette and it's very similar to what she has in her lap and you can see there's a little bellows there and as you turn the crank you not only operate the bellows but you um, turn the cylinder which is pinned and controls the organ pipes that you can see in the background there and so you could listen to opera music this way again Mozart wrote for these sorts of things but what if you were even poorer than that and you couldn't even afford a serenette well there were street organs and at the left is a book that was published in France uh, about street organs and that book was published in 1775 so certainly well within the time frame for the marriage of Figaro so people who didn't even see the opera could well have been singing the tunes of the opera based on what they heard on their serenet or street organ or some other device so that's getting the opera out of the opera house to the home how about the plot of the Nozze di Figaro itself. Well, no worries, I'm not going to give you any spoilers to the plot if you haven't seen the opera yet. But there are two important plot points, and one is, is someone in the right place? And the other is, 
Can a spouse detect a disguised spouse at night when it's dark? So let's see what role technology plays in those two points. Well, today, if you want to find out if someone's in the right place, you can just pick up your mobile phone and dial someone, say, hey, you know, is he or she there? I'm looking for that person. But there were no mobile phones in 1786. So how might a message been transmitted um, more quickly than by someone on a horse? Well, one possibility is carrier pigeon. It's not an anachronism. There were certainly carrier pigeons available uh, way back in even ancient Egyptian times. But it is a bit messy. I'm not sure the count would have wanted to have a um, place full of pigeons on his estate. The pigeons tend to uh, get rid of materials in ways that we are not comfortable with. And um, there's also the issue that for the pigeon to fly from the estate to the person you were looking for, um, that pigeon would have to um, have had a home at that location, and then the location would have to send the pigeon back to the count, and that pigeon would have to have had a home at the count, so probably couldn't use carrier pigeon. But here is the first proposal for an electric telegraph, and it appeared in the Scots Magazine in, lo and behold, 1753. So again, this is well before the opening of Marriage of Figaro at the Wiener Burgtheater. And um, it's a proposal for an electric telegraph. It's even a proposal for insulated wires, but there's no indication that that was built and uh, the word telegraph didn't exist, so it was called an expeditious method of conveying intelligence by means of electricity. But what happened shortly after the premiere of Marriage of Figaro was this. It was Claude Chappé's system of a visual telegraph, and he actually originally wanted to call his system a tachygraph, which would mean fast writing, and a friend said, nah, you know, why don't you call it telegraph for distant writing? And so the word telegraph was coined for his system, and there would be a series of towers across France, and you could send a message from one end of France to the other in a matter of a couple of minutes. Um, by the way, if you encounter a place uh, called Telegraph Hill, as in San Francisco, um, the reason that it's called Telegraph Hill is that's where they would have put the tower for a visual telegraph system. Um, but again, this happened after Marriage of Figaro, so we can't fault the plot for that. So what about the other plot point that I'm mentioning, the Are You My Spouse plot point? Well, uh, as you can see from this image, if it's late at night, it's dark, uh, you want to see who it is, you just turn on your flashlight. Well, at the right is the first um, patent probably for a tubular flashlight, what we would today call a flashlight. It looks very similar to a modern flashlight. But that was 1899, and the earliest patent for any form of electric lantern, uh, same inventor, David Missell, um, patent was issued in 1896. So you probably weren't going to use an electric light, certainly not in 1786. That's a century before this stuff. So what other possibilities? Well, here is an image from the first illustrated edition of Le Mariage de Figaro, the Beaumarchais play on which uh, Marriage of Figaro or Le Nozze di Figaro, the opera, is based. And uh, here's an image of the denouement, and you see someone is holding a torch, and it's quite bright, and so that woman seated at the center is holding up a fan to shield her uh, face because the light is so bright. So certainly you could tell who was who with that big bright torch there, but that's not exactly what you might have wanted to hold if you were doing something surreptitious in the garden. So why not a candle lantern? And you could actually cover it with a cloth and remove the cloth uh, when you got where you were going and see who was who. Here's a late 19th century candle lantern. That seems like a good possibility. Well, you actually couldn't. Here's the Metropolitan Opera House, a uh, picture from the stage. And remember I showed you those chandeliers up near the ceiling? 
well, you don't see any chandeliers near the ceiling. Instead, what you see is those chandeliers uh, in front of the second um, balcony uh, at the Met. It's called the Grand Tier. And they're right in people's way. They would block the view of the stage. So when you come into the Met for a performance, those chandeliers are down. And then before the performance begins, they get drawn up to the ceiling. And so they're in that position that you saw in the diagram earlier. And it's not just at the Met. Here is an image of the uh, 107-seat Amato Opera, the old Amato Opera. Uh, their last show was on May 31st, 2009, and it was The Marriage of Figaro. Um, this picture is by permission of Laura Rosano, and uh, she has really, really good information about the Amato Opera at this link. But same kind of thing happened. The chandelier would be down before the opera began, and then it would get drawn up to the ceiling. So is was the Amato doing it in homage to the Met? But what was the Met doing it in homage to? Well, it turns out that in the old days, you could not have a chandelier in an opera house before about the middle of the uh, 19th century and not remove it before the first act. So we have accounts from um, the early days of opera in 17th century Venice of a gigantic chandelier hanging over the uh, audience and then before the opera starts the ceiling opens and the chandelier gets pulled all the way up into the ceiling and then the ceiling closes and the house is plunged into darkness. Now why is this? Well Michael Faraday, the great physicist, um, gave a series of children's lectures um, during the uh, Christmas holidays of 1860 to 61 called The Chemical History of a Candle. And he was celebrating the candles that had been developed in the mid-19th century. And they were wonderful devices, uh, but very different from what existed before the mid-19th century. And he makes reference to that in his lectures. And uh, the candles that existed before the mid-19th century were very dim, they were soft, they were smoky and stinky, and Marie Antoinette complained about that at her opera house uh, at one point. Um, they were often toxic, and most important for our purposes, the wicks were not consumed. One of the great innovations of mid-19th century candles was that the wicks would be consumed as they burned. Instead, the fuel, the wax of the candle, would be consumed, and the wick just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so you had devices like what you see at the right here, candle snuffers, special pairs of scissors that would be used to trim the wicks. And so if you had candles on stage, the uh, singers would go around with these candle snuffers and they could trim the wicks while they were singing. And if you had sconces around the walls of the opera house, then you could have footmen who would go up and down the aisles and they would trim the wicks on the sconces. But it wasn't possible to trim the wicks on candles on chandeliers. Uh, you couldn't erect a ladder in the middle of the audience and climb up and trim the wicks. And so that's why the ceiling would open, the chandelier would go up into the ceiling, the ceiling would close, and then they could deal with the candles there and then light them and lower the chandelier again at the end of the opera for exit lighting. And one of the innovations of the first opera house in 1637 was that it was a very large auditorium to amortize the cost of opera. And so it needed a chandelier. If you just had sconce lighting, there wasn't enough lighting for the audience. If you couldn't use a candle, what could you use? Well, you could use some form of oil lamp, but the problem was oil lamps were very, very dim. It wasn't until um, what was called the Argand lamp, which was patented in 1784 by a Swiss scientist, um, which brought air up inside the wick as well as outside the wick to create a very bright lamp, um, that anyone had any kind of bright oil lamp. And so here is a comment that Thomas Jefferson made in 1784 that the Argand lamp had a light equal to six or eight candles. Well, that's really great, except the Argand lamp was very complicated. It required gravity feed of the viscous oil, so it was hot, it was angle sensitive, uh, needed the gravity feed, so not so great for handheld outdoor use. 
Now, in 1800, a little after Le Nozze di Figaro came out, there was a version called the Carcel Clockwork Lamp, which used a little pump to move the oil so it didn't need the gravity feed reservoir. But even that, you know, you're not going to go on a tryst at night with this thing going tick, 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 tick. And again, modern candles and kerosene lamps were not really available until the mid-19th century. And so I think that we can give um, that plot point to Le Nozze di Figaro as well. So uh, that's my formal presentation, and I will now be happy to entertain any questions. And again, these slides are available at bit.ly slash Thank you.